That will that never, never work. work. You can't, you can't publish, publish that. Seriously? No, 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 Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 104 of Horrible Writing. I am your host, Paul Sading. With me in episode 104 is Lindsay Schaffer, an award-winning author of The Adventures of Kelton Moore, sci-fi survivalist novel, Lost Under Two Moons, short story collections, and a whole bunch more. He's also an award-winning fantasy author as well for his story, Into the North. Lindsay, welcome to Horrible Writing. Thanks so much, Paul. It's great to be here. It's a one, You've been very patient. Now, those of you who are uh, just public listeners of the show, I, I love each and every download and stream of the show, and I'm honored to have you here. But I do have a special section of fans of the show, patrons over at patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, if you want to join us, who are going to get some serious exclusive content this time around. Because in between my last episode, which was almost 30 episodes ago, and now I've forgotten how to read bios. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Lindsay is, thankfully, Lindsay is a local person. So if I ever get a chance to meet him, see him, I'm buying him a beer for what I just did to his bio that you're not going to hear. But I promise it's all (laughs) downhill or uphill, depending on your perspective from here. It's going to be better (laughs) because Lindsay's going to be the feature of the show and not I. Lindsay, I want to welcome you to the show. And I, I am very excited to talk to you today because in the months since you and I met and I uh, pitched the show idea to you, uh, there's been a lot of things that have happened in my own life, ups and downs, you know, types of stuff that writers slash authors go through. And the Horrible Writing Facebook community has really blossomed over the time, opened up, it's grown, we're going to hit, we'll be over 500 members by the time this show goes out. And folks are finally opening up and sharing their personal journeys slash struggles through their own writing. And you pitched the topic of hope to me, and I think it's that's an essential conversation for writers to have. This show is listened to by a lot of different folks. I used to believe it was all new writers and uh, aspiring authors, but I've come to find out that that's not the case. There are experienced slash published authors who also tune in to the shows, not only the standalone things, but these author interviews. And I believe it's because of what we share with each other. And it's all about lifting people up when we share our own stories and our own perspectives. So you've hit on a really key topic. So what I kind of want to start with is helping everyone understand who is Lindsay as a human when it comes to the topic of hope. Were you born and bred into a world of hope? Or is this something more of a life skill that you had to develop your own form or fashion to help you deal with? with the stuff that we call life? Um, Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty heavy question to start us off with. Yes, it is. uh, That's, that's, that's good. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, I, I, I I did grow up in, in a home that uh, had a lot of support. Um, You know, I, I grew up, uh, if, if you have a a lot of, a a lot of people that have been doing the arts uh, listening to you for, all of their life, like from, from childhood and adolescence up, this might be familiar to you that, um, you grew up wondering, am I as good as my mother says I am, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like you, you're, you're writing. And in my case, I actually, um, I didn't start writing in, uh, prose and novels and short stories. I actually started writing for the stage and, um, was putting on full length productions in seventh grade and had my own acting company in high school. And so I, I grew up hearing things like, wow, this, this play was so good for someone of your age. 
And, you know, it's at first that's like, well, thanks. That's that's fantastic. But after a while, you start to think, you know, I'm not going to be this age forever. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't skate by on on the fact that, wow, you're so young and it's so good for someone of your age. It's like, well, I just want it to be good just on its own, regardless of how old I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I guess in with with that kind of background, I didn't really need as much hope. I felt like there was a, a lot of support. There was a lot of, of faith that people had in me. It was probably more after that. And kind of when I, when I left that, that support, th- those of you that um, were, those of you that, that were uh, uh, in our earlier segment, um, that was just for the patrons. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, I, I got to play electric guitar at my own graduation, but then my, my fame my local fame kind of drops significantly after high school. And I think that that's true for a lot of us, right? You know, we're rock stars when we're in, in, in high school mm-hmm. and you know, it's, Oh, we, we're just, we're the bomb where everybody knows us. Everyone's talking about us, but all of a sudden you go from, you know, that little bitty pond to a gigantic pond. And it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm not the big cheese anymore. I'm, I'm not the only game in town. Um, mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, that was when I started to realize, oh, I I need hope. <laughs> I I can't just rely on my small town um, fame anymore. Now all of a sudden, I'm part of a much larger community. That's a. How old were you when you had that? <clears throat> I'll call it an epiphany. You can call it whatever you want. But how old were you? And was there an inciting incident that kind of brought you to that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, so out of, out of high school, I actually took, um, a two year break, uh, from any kind of writing, um, to, uh, serve a, a mission. Um, I'm a member of the church, Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. So I went and, um, spent two years on the Navajo reservation in New Mexico. Um, and, uh, while I was there, unfortunately, um, I, uh, I developed a health condition, um, that, uh, I'd had some problems with headaches and stuff as, as a kid, you know, migraines and stuff, but I'd never really had a lot of neurological problems. But, um, while I was on my mission, um, I actually developed a condition of periodic paralysis where I would, uh, get, uh, I I would get these kind of paralytic attacks where I could be paralyzed from the neck down anywhere from a few minutes to as long as several hours. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, which that's frightening. Unfortunately. Yeah, it was. It definitely was. Um, so, uh, I had to, you know, I, I, I had to come home. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there was a period where I wasn't really, wasn't doing much of anything. I fell into some pretty dark depression, you know, because I had been so active and, and so lively. And now all of a sudden I was living under this, this cloud of at any moment, I won't be able to move. Right. Um, I went to, I, I went to a friend of mine uh, who had I actually met on the mission. He and I had become really close friends. He actually live, uh, lives up in Victoria, Canada. So um, when we had been on the mission, we'd, we'd had all these wonderful plans of going into movies together, right, going into the film business, because I had a theater background and he had a, a film background. So I went up to Canada uh, to try to look at schools with him. We were going to, we were going to go to school together find a film school to go to so we went to one we toured one we're like oh this this looks great it was in vancouver canada i applied i got a scholarship there and uh i said oh, hey i got i got in uh did you get in he said oh i didn't apply it i'm i didn't apply i'm getting married instead <laughs> <laughs> i'm like dude i'm leaving the country to i'm leaving my country to come up and go to school with you and he's like well yeah but i i need something more reliable uh yes. than film school mm-hmm. so I went, so, uh, going to film school, all of a sudden I was completely out of my element. Um, I, I tried writing a, a screenplay, um, for a student production and it went horribly. Um, and, uh, after that I was just, you know, I, after, after having gone through all this, I, I did my one year at the film school, got my, my certificate, came home to Washington and I was just, uh, I was at this point where I was incredibly depressed. I was taking a couple of online classes, wasn't really working, didn't know what I was going to do with myself for the rest of my life. And I wish I could say that there was like just this one moment where all of a sudden, you know, like, you know, sunshine, sunshine streamed through the, the window. And all of a sudden there was a, ah! 
what? You know, but <laughs> you're really a writer. Wasn't. Make it up on the fly. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. But honestly, I think it's more it's more significant that life isn't always like a story. And right. um, I didn't have that one moment. I just gradually over time decided this isn't what I want the rest of my life to be. I don't want to be defined by the problems that have happened to me. I don't want to be defined by the bad luck that I may have had. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start turning things around. Um, and it happened gradually, but over time, um, I was able to start working on my next book. I went, to, went back to college, uh, got my bachelor's degree. Um, this was around the time that I started working on my, my first novel. Um, I, I met, uh, my, beautiful wife who uh, ended up being an incredible support to me and things just started turning around. And, you know, I eventually, my first book was, I self-published my first book and it's just kind of gone on from there. Um, like I said, I, I wish I could say, well, suddenly, suddenly this brilliant moment happened and everything turned around, but it didn't. It just took a lot of work and sweat and blood and tears and slowly it, I, I turned it around. Well, and I think you're absolutely spot on though in the way you said it, I'm not going to be able to say it as eloquently as you, but it, in that struggle, that slow burn of turning things around is, I, I feel that's where that sustainability of perspective is built, right? That's where you be, right. you change your mindset and you start seeing the world because you didn't have that one break that, or that one moment. So when somebody's listening to you right now, and they hear that you had, I mean, you had your struggles, we all do, but you had a good foundation upon which to launch from your childhood through. And they're determined to say, Lindsay, I hear you, but that's not my case. When you think about your own life and those moments where you slip back maybe, or that those moments when you were going through all that stuff and struggling with the depression and whatnot, what specifics... What specific things, what spe specific elements of the world around you, um, transcendent or not, material or not, sentient or not, but what specific things would you reach that hand, that olive branch out to that person and say, hey, this is where I found hope. This is where I found hope. Something to ground them on. What types of things would you recommend people look at and look toward? Right. Well, for for one thing, um, I I would I would never um, I, I would I would never try to tell somebody I know how you're feeling, mm -hmm. or you know I I went through the same thing, or even <laughs> the, the the worst is well you think that's bad, <laughs> 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 right? Because I mean I've 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 heard all all of those things too, and they're they're just as as useless and frustrating to me as they would be to somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't know what it's like uh, for me. And, and even if you looked at the superficial, you know, you look at the outside, you don't know what's going on inside. Right. Somebody could have, you know, be, be doing wonderfully well on the outside. And then, you know, you look in, you look on the interior and it's just, it's a constant thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just a wasteland inside them. Um, so as, as far as what I can, what I can offer, um, you know, I, I think that, I, I, I pitched to you the idea of hope, and I think that hope is sometimes confused uh, with faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that faith isn't also important. Faith, faith is, is definitely important. Faith is, is trying to um, believe that things will work out, right? There's, a, there's a, a, an aspect of confidence with faith. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's the leap of faith. That's why we call it that, because we actually act on it. Hope, on the other hand, is your attitude as you're making that leap of faith. Hope is, hope is giving yourself permission to want something that the world would say is unlikely or that you might even say is unlikely. Hope is giving yourself permission to, uh, you know, not just say, well, the sun will rise again tomorrow. Hope is saying the sun is going to rise tomorrow. And it'll be a gorgeous day, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I, I think that that's really important. Um, I, I think that it's important not to get our hopes up to the point where we're constantly just setting ourselves up for disappointment. Um, but by hoping for hoping for better things, 
right? It gives us some, it gives us a reason to try because if we don't have any hope at all, if, if we don't even have a vision of what could happen, of what the positive things in life could be, then yeah, there's no reason to continue at all because I mean, you, you can't even, you can't even see a reason to continue, uh-huh. but yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that hope is the only thing, um, that, uh, you'll, you'll need, um, you know, to get through difficult times, but I, f- I feel like it's definitely an essential element. You know, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's perhaps it's, it's not reasonable. It's not rational to hope that you're going to, uh, sell millions of books over the course of your life. Um, but you can hope for that. Mm-hmm. You know, you can, you can hope to have, uh, fans that will contact you and will tell you how much they love your books. You can hope for, Success. This is, um, I teach a business creative writing class, um, at uh, South Puget Sound Community College. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'll talk to my students about is, you know, you need to have realistic expectations, but you also need to give yourself permission to dream. Mm -hmm. There's, there's been a, in, I feel like in our, in our society, uh, today, there's kind of been some pushback against, uh, dreaming. You know, there, there's, I don't, I don't know if, if uh, you've kind of noticed uh, this a little bit, but, you know, like there have been like speakers at graduation ceremonies and stuff, people who talk to millennials. And um, I, I think maybe it's a resistance against the feeling that a lot of millennials kind of feel an entitlement, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, I'm 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 here on Earth. So I deserve all kinds of success and glory and wonderful things just because I'm here. Right. That's not the case. But I think it's it's too much an extreme to to go go the other way and say, you don't deserve anything and you shouldn't expect anything. Right. Right. I mean, life is tough. Life is hard, but that doesn't mean that we can't hope for a better day. Absolutely. With when we're talking about hope, what, what I'd love to be able to hear you uh, speak on is in terms of being an author, because this is a writing podcast after all, let's focus it on, uh, on to your work now and, and outcomes. I obviously, <laughs> I think it would come through in your writing, any of our writing, not just yours, but anyone's writing, if they had the worldview that was completely void of any sense of hope. So obviously it's a useful tool. It served you well. But if you could kind of maybe talk about the impact on your work in an example or two that you feel, hey, when... When the weight was on my shoulders, it was this worldview that I have of, you know, even enter, even entertaining that that concept of hope of what could be in your own terms, in your own words, obviously. But in those moments when that hope has carried you through and, and you've got those real world examples that impact on your writing, your writing career that were, was kind of served in a in a at least a significant way by the fact that you embrace this spirit of hope. Yeah. So, you know, there, there are definitely times and I'm sure that, uh, your, your listeners will, uh, empathize with this. There have definitely been times when I put out a book and, you know, there's, there's some initial sales and then, you know, you, you see the, uh, you see the, the chart that's showing your sales kind of, it starts to kind of ground out and, uh, you know, day by day, it just starts to go, you know, flat line. And you're like, Oh gosh, why am I even doing this? Mm -hmm. Why? why am I bothering to do this? Maybe I should just quit and do something else. Um, and you know, on, honestly, like I, like I said, uh, before it's, there isn't just a single moment of aha and, and, you know, come bouncing back, but it's just a gradual over time restrengthening. I like what you said before, um, when you were talking about that gradual change, um, has lasting change. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's something I really believe is, is, you know, slow growth means lasting growth. Um, it's one of the reasons why when I, when I talk to my students, um, I always encourage them when it comes to writing goals, I encourage them to have a goal of writing a minimum of a hundred words a day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of them will say, well, gosh, that's not very much. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a minimum. You know, you don't have to <laughs> only write a hundred words. That's your minimum. But I do that for two reasons. One what are the hardest words to get done of any session? It's the first hundred. Um, but you know, and, and that'll jumpstart you hopefully to get more done. But even if, even if that's not the case, even if that's all you can get done in a day, 
at least you got some writing done that day. Right. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's helped me to see after days and days of just doing small increments of writing, how far I can get just by doing a little bit. Now, as far as like, how does my, my feeling of hope, how does it actually affect uh, my writing itself? Like the, the stories that I write, um, you know, I, I see a lot of, I see a lot of myself in my characters. Um, you know, certainly my, my characters struggle with, um, a lot of the same, similar things I do because it's, it's what I know. So, you know, they're struggling with hope. They're struggling with, uh, feeling out of place or, or worrying, you know, am, am I doing the right thing? And, you know, it, it, it may sound a little bit funny, but, um, I feel like I've developed kind of a, a friendship with, especially with Kelton Moore, because now I've done three books in his series now. And, you know, he's not just an action hero. He's, uh, somebody who he experiences emotional uh, upheavals. He he go. He's trying to do the right thing for the right reasons, but it doesn't always work out for him. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he's well intentioned, and sometimes he's not as well intentioned. And and you know things happen as a result both ways. Um, but I think that our shared experiences between uh, him and I, um, they've given me insight into his character, and I think they've added a lot of emotional weight and depth to these stories. Um, I've actually had some people uh, who have talked to me about the stories and I'll ask them what their favorite part is and what, what they like best. And, you know, there's always a few people that say, I want more monster fighting, more monsters. <laughs> um, but, but then there, there are other people that are like, you know what? I, my favorite parts are the parts where uh, he is uh, dealing with uh, his family or, you know, the, the times when he is trying to figure out, how love works and how romance works um, or the, uh, the social problems that he runs into, you know, there's a, there's an ongoing theme throughout the series of dealing with uh, prejudice and uh, bigotry. Um, and uh, you know, all of those kinds of themes, I think if I wasn't willing to kind of bleed onto the page a little bit, mm-hmm. I think that I, uh, I, I don't think that the character would have developed the way he did. I don't think I would have developed the way that I have um, because it's, it's actually helped me to process a lot of things as well. How now reverse that for me. How has the writing journey, the publishing journey affected you, the human being, your sense of hope, because you kind of teased us slash hinted on it when you talked about, that evil, evil dashboard of sales. <laughs> and <laughs> if we don't, and I'm so glad you share this message with your students because it's something I try to thematically refresh folks' minds on once in a while in our own horrible writing group because we're fragile creatures as creatives anyways. And, right. you know, we believe in something. We put our baby out there. It's a very vulnerable moment. And, Even if you have great initial sales, the the business aspect of it, you have great initial sales. Inevitably, unless you're one of the very select few, you're going to see that tail off effect. And I'm Mm -hmm. curious for you, the human, um, whatever, it it may not even be sales for you. It may just be a critical review or something, but you get that thing that sucker punches Lindsay's sense of hope. Um, And I'm curious how you deal with that, how, what it feels like, but then how do you recover, get back on your feet again? Right. Well, uh, how, how does it feel? It sucks. <laughs> Easy answer. <It> absolutely sucks. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm, I'm the kind of person, unfortunately, who uh, sometimes has um, all or nothing thinking. Mm-hmm. I, I know that's one of the issues that I have. So I'm, I'm the kind of person who, um, you know, some, there's some devastating something or other, you know, like I, I look at the sales and I haven't had anything for the longest time or, you know, what's, what probably the thing that's most frustrating for me. And I'll, I'll share this with, uh, with your listeners because they probably have felt the same way. At least I hope they have, um, <laughs> not, not, not hoping, uh, that, that they've gone through something terrible, but hoping <laughs> I'm not alone. Um, I, my, the, the hardest thing for me is when somebody else has done something which has worked for them, right? You know, a a sales technique or, uh, entering into a contest or whatever else. And, um, I try doing the same thing and I fail at it. 
and I see my peers or I see these other people just rising up and I'm still down where I am. Mm -hmm. And I look at them and, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give myself this much credit. I, I, Usually, I'm not wishing them ill <laughs> for, <laughs> for for you know rising above me, but you know there there's always this feeling of well, why not me? Yeah, I'm not yeah. any less worthy, right? I I I deserve that too. Yeah. Um, that's probably by far the hardest thing for me to accept, uh, for me to take is when something doesn't work for me. That's working for all these other people, even people that sometimes I think you know what. I deserve that just as much as they did, if not more. Why are they getting that? Mm-hmm. Why are they? Why did they win that award? Why did they get uh, this this speaking spot? Um, you know, at a conference. Why did they? Whatever you know, fill in the blank. This you know, there's plenty of of examples of this. Right. How do I tr- how do I deal with that? Um, I try to focus on something that is unique to me. I try to focus on something that only I am getting out of my writing a success that only I am I'm receiving. So I'll give you I'll give you an example of this. So um, I I'm not getting uh, this the sales that I wish I was getting. I think that uh, that's probably true of just about every professional author out there, with the exception of a few that we can probably name. Uh, right. which, which means that there aren't a lot of them. <laughs> if you can name all the ones that, that don't, uh, that, that aren't worried about sales and that means there aren't very many of them. <laughs> um, so, so that's something that that's a constant that I'm having to deal with. But the other day, this is just a few weeks ago. Um, I got, uh, an email, um, from a high school student in Idaho, somewhere in Idaho. And uh, she was writing to me to say that uh, she had been sitting in her English class. I think she's a sophomore at the time. So she's a sophomore in English. She was done with her assignment early. She got bored. Um, she went over to her teacher's bookshelf and saw a copy of Lost in Two Moons, my first novel there. So she thought the cover looked interesting. She took it down. She started reading. She asked her teacher if she could borrow it. She read it that week. And then wrote me an email to let me know how much she liked. It. Oh, that's awesome! I have no idea how that book ended up on that you know English teacher's bookshelf there. Um, I've I've never even done a, an author event in Idaho at this point. Um, so I I don't know how that got there. I don't know how how it got to her, but just getting that out of the blue mm-hmm. is fantastic. And I think about how many times is that happening, and I don't hear about it. Right. Right. Um, this book has been out. It's it was published in 2012. So it's it's you know seven years now. How many times have people had this experience where I'm I'm not necessarily hearing it? You know, it's not like being a singer or an actor where you know you you get to immediately get hear the applause when you do a good job. Um, but if you kind of imagine and picture little scattered applause throughout the world when somebody reads your book and you're like, you know what? This is happening. It's out there. Right. I may not be able to see all of it, but every now and then I get a sneak peek of it. I'll, I'll give you one one other example, just because I I, I love sharing this. Um, again, I had uh, I I was on Goodreads, and luckily um, I had just been kind of browsing reviews, and I saw someone who wrote a review, uh, uh, another another student who'd wrote, written a review on one of my books, saying, "I really love this book." I wish that I could talk to the author to find out um, some more details about his creatures. Oh, that's so, so cool. <laughs> so I said, well, what the heck? So I, you know, I, I, I did a reply and I said, well, hey, I'm the author. What, what questions do you have? And uh, this student wrote back and said, I'm so glad you wrote me back. I'm doing a book report on your book and it's due tomorrow. And I'm trying to figure out how to do the illustrations. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, I'm definitely going to help you with this. So I'm, <laughs> I'm texting them back or, you know, messaging them back and forth, helping them figure out how to get their book report ready on my book for the next day, because it was due the next day. <laughs> I mean, how awesome is that? That is worth, you know, so many just random numbers of sales and stuff. That's a real human connection. Right. right. You know, and that is, that's unique to, to me and my situation. So, you know, having that one student there, but think about what, what are the unique things that you are getting out of your writing? 
Where, what are the connections, the human connections that your writing is making with your readers? And I think, I mean, that's so important, right? Because I think we are, we're very selective creatures on what we choose to recognize and not recognize. And um, I love that you cited essentially what are qualitative examples instead of quantitative, right? When it, in terms of giving hope, because I, I think we're just, we're so hard. I, 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 I beg you horrible writing audience to think about this as from your, from the perspective of, of a consumer, how many times have you read a great novel, entertaining novel, a fulfilling novel, and took the time to pop open your smartphone or get on your laptop and email the author, right? We don't do it. And right. Lindsay's example right there, it, those two examples are, are they're just the blip of a, of a much bigger picture, you know, for you gaming geeks, right? It's the fog of war. You can't see the rest of the landscape. You can only see that one little immediate area around you. So if you choose to focus on the fact that, Hey, this student tripped across my book, read it, loved it, reached out to me. How many other faceless examples of that student are out there that they're just, they were moved. They enjoyed it. You hit them in the sweet spot. They just don't feel compelled to take the time. It's not in a uh, condemnation of you as a writer. It's it, that mindset. In, yeah. It, and it's the comfort zone. I mean, we're, we're all introverts, so I probably wouldn't be the kind of person to reach out either. Right. Right. <laughs> exact. Great point. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, being completely honest, <laughs> when, when you sit down to write anything, I, a short story, or if we're talking about your next novel, it, are you the audience of one type of writer, meaning that that book that you're writing, th those 80,000 words that you're going to ultimately spend a year on, is that for you first or, or, or a significant other, or, you know, somebody important oh, in your life? Absolutely for me first. Okay. I, I always write. I, I, am, I am my biggest fan. Um, I have to be. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if I'm not my own biggest fan, what's the point in writing? You know, um, I, I, I write the kind of stories that I write the kind of stories that, uh, I would have told myself as a kid playing make believe in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that, that's how I played as, as a kid, I would, I would make up stories to, you know, these tales of fantasy and adventure. And then I'd go on those adventures. Those are the kind of stories that I write. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I recognize there, there are some people out there who write stories and they are not the audience for them. But I, I question um, how, how I, I question sometimes, you know, is, is it is it harder for you to have hope? Is it harder for you to mm -hmm. believe in a piece if it's not something that connects with you personally? Right. If you're just writing it for, you know, a, a cold calculated, well, this is what will sell. Um, you know, it, are, you you might be willing to invest time and you might be willing to invest talent, but are you willing to invest heart and invest mm -hmm. a little bit of who you are into it? No, and I'm glad you said that because that's exactly the thought processes that went through my mind. And I said, I'm going to ask him <laughs> because I don't know how that is sustainable if that's where they are. I don't, I'm exactly of the same mind as you on that. So I had to get your opinion on that. Now, I do want to get one more help full question in before we I'm going to hit you with a very fun question um, <laughs> that you're going to get okay. to share something very personal and intimate with the world. So it'll be awesome. <laughs> but before oh, we God. do that, um, I'm big on <laughs> I'm big on servitude. I you know, this I call it my horrible writing family because it really is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, this writing is lonely. It's difficult. We yeah. when we put our fingers on the keyboard, we're also doing this mental dance with some of the demons in our own head. So it's an exhausting process. There are going to be people who are listening to you right now and your message is resonating with them. And what I'd like to, you know, one last focus on hope, what I'd like to have you take them out on is in your own opinion, obviously you're, you're not a professional counselor on this type of stuff, but Going forward for that person starting today, whoever that faceless listener is right now, they're still an important person. When you start thinking about if they were asking your opinion, if they were sitting across that desk from you and saying, hey, Lindsay, you know, how do you find 
hope in things? How do you strengthen that one little element of hope that you have so you can start changing your mindset to be focused on those qualitative things like the student who trips across the book and loves it versus the fact that nobody's bought my book for a month type of thing. Besides setting realistic goals, what would be something that you would look look back at them across that desk and say, hey, this is something that would help me. Maybe it'll help you. Okay. Um, so this is, this is what helps me. Um, and, and hopefully, hopefully it, it helps your, uh, some of your listeners as well. But when I get to that point, when I'm struggling for hope, when I'm, when I'm feeling, you know, why am I, why am I doing this? It's, it's so hard. Um, and actually here, let me, let me back up real quick. Can I, can I share one, one more quick experience? Oh, definitely. Um, okay. So, um, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. So I have a friend, um, uh, who has a twin brother. Now, my friend's twin is uh, incredibly attractive, uh, incredibly skilled. He's the kind of guy who can listen to a song uh, on the radio and immediately play it back for you on three different instruments. Oh, I hate uh, that guy. He's, <laughs> I know. I, don't, don't you hate those kind of guys? Um, you know, he's, he's you know top of his class, all these things, all, the, all these amazing accolades that my friend's twin has. Now, my friend uh, was born with uh, some disabilities. Um, he's not able to walk very well. Um, he's, he's very smart, um, but he has a speech impediment, mm-hmm. which, uh, makes some people, uh, think that he's slow. Mm-hmm. He's not, but you know, he, he just has a difficult time communicating sometimes and, uh, everything is a little bit harder for him. Um, just compared to your average person. Mm-hmm. Now he grew up most certainly in the shadow of his brother. and yet. My friend is one of the most cheerful people that you'll meet, and uh, he's just happy with life. And I remember I asked him one time, I said, so tell me your secret. <laughs> Why are you so happy? You know, I didn't say because of your, you know, I didn't mention his brother, but, right. you know, just how, how are you so happy all the time? And he says, well, Lindsay, anything in life is hard. Everything in life is hard. Even being lazy is hard. Because everything has a price. Uh Failing is hard. Being successful is hard. Everything is hard. So if everything is hard, why don't you just do the things that you love? Uh Because it's all going to be difficult anyway. So what I do, so this is back to to where I started with this. Um, What I do for myself is I reevaluate what can I do to make this something that I love again. Uh what needs to happen for me to love this process. Um, Sometimes um, I may feel really stressed about a story that I'm trying to work on. It's just not working out right. So I'll say, you know what? I'm going to put that story on hold. I'm going to do a different story, which is just my story. This is just from me. Maybe this never even gets published. This is just something for me to enjoy to work on. Um, And uh, I did that. And I just uh, published book three of that series. (laughs) It's amazing how that happens. I love and it. I'm still working on that other one. That other one is still <laughs> a work in progress. It's been a work in progress for 10 years now. It'll be amazing when it's finally done. Um, but those are the kinds of things that I, that's the kind of thing that I found that works for me is to reevaluate where I'm at and change it in some way so that it is something that I love uh-huh. because everything is hard. Everything has a price. So why not do something that you love? I love that. I absolutely love that. It's so empowering to talk to people with that kind of perspective. It really is. Yeah. You know, I as, as smart as I am, I'm incredibly dumb to know what I don't know. I'm smart enough to know what I don't know, but too dumb to see the things that I I have in front of me and how e- easy, air quotes, I'm trying to be careful here, how easy it is to have <laughs> the right mindset and how powerful it is once you not just capture that mindset, but you actually behaviorally, I mean, you have to do, you have to act on those things to, to sustain it, right? It's just like almost like a weight loss program. You can't just crash diet and then expect to keep the weight off. You have to make those behavioral behavioral changes. And it's just right. like this and, with me. And, um, sorry, just, you know, a mindset, I don't think really is a mindset until you're acting on it. Yeah. Great. You point. Know, a, a change isn't a change in, in your, in your brain doesn't really help unless there's a change in your actions that reflects it. No, great point. Absolutely. 
So with the, I mean, this has been a fun conversation, but it's been kind of he- heavy and probably giving yeah. people things to reflect on, which is my goal. I'd never set out to set this podcast out to be yet another writing podcast. I wanted it to be personal. I wanted it mm-hmm. to focus on the journey. Obviously, the struggles are the things that kill a lot of people in terms of their writing dreams. So each and every time I interview somebody, it's one more tool we get to put in our tool belt to help us deal with all these things that we're, all of us are constantly faced with so that we can create and we can keep putting our creations out there to to the world for them to enjoy. Now, Lindsay, as a good host, I have one more thing I need to do to you, and that is to put you on the spot because like a uh-huh. good host, that's what a good host does. For you, if you are a first-time listener, welcome to the show, and I hope you're enjoying this interview with Lindsay. You're going to probably take a step back when I ask him this next question, but I promise there's an almost altruistic, altruistic, good-natured purpose behind me asking him this. I'm going to ask him for a horrible writing experience. Now, give me that aghast reaction, but then come back and listen to this uh, answer that he's about to give, because the reason I do it each and every time I have an author on the show, they've been through life. Something has happened to them. It may be funny, silly, embarrassing, humiliating. It may have been traumatic. I don't know what Lindsay's about to say. We don't script this out. I just asked to ask guests to give us a raw, horrible writing experience. But what I want you to do is I want you to sit back, relax, listen to the, the story he's going to share with us and reflect. How does it relate to you? Listen to what Lindsay's been through. Look at where Lindsay is at today, even having been through that experience. And what can you do for yourself? So Lindsay, with that introduction to the horrible writing experience, what is oh your goodness. horrible writing experience? Oh my goodness. Um, well, it's, it's a little bit hard because I, I feel like, you know, kind of the, the whole, the whole conversation has been kind of about, you know, how to deal with whole, horrible writing experiences. And, and, you know, I've, I've kind of talked about some kind of heavy things that have happened to me. So, but, but let me give you, um, let me give you just kind of a, a, a little example of something, um, we all know how important Amazon reviews are, mm-hmm. right? We it's 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 an essential thing, um, especially if uh, you know since Amazon is our our number one market for uh, book sales. Um, so when my first book went out, Lost Star Two Moons goes out. Um, for the longest time, I had no reviews, and um, I was just I I was I was crushed. I, I was I knew that I needed reviews, so I go out and I'm I'm on social media. I'm saying, hey guys, if you've read my book, please please, uh, give it a good review or, or just an honest review. Um, because we, we need something there. So finally I go out and the book has a review five stars. Nice. I go out and I look at it. The first line, it says, I have not read Lindsay's book, but I know Lindsay and he's a nice guy. Oh no. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm just sitting there like, Awesome. Thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, and, wow. and that that review. OK, I, I, that that review has stuck with me for a long time because it was the only review I had for a long time. And then when I finally got other reviews, that review, because it was the only review I had up for a while, people would go and upvote it. So yes. <laughs> e- even after I had reviews from people that had actually read my book, it was still the most upvoted review. <laughs> oh, my God. So when you would pull up my book, even when you know it says, oh, here's the most helpful positive review. Here's the most helpful negative review. The most positive, you know, most helpful positive reviews. I haven't read this book, but Lindsay is a nice guy. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks. God. <laughs> oh, man. That is that is so that's such a beautiful story because that's somebody with the right approach to life and they just wanted to help out. And in, but see, but see the, 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 the downside was this was someone I'd met at a writing conference. So <laughs> it was another writer. Oh, they should have known better. They should have known. Okay. It's yeah. not like this was my grandmother or something. This was like somebody that like they should have known. <laughs> I, okay. I take all that back. You should writer anonymous writer. You should have known better. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh my uh, gosh <laughs> but it, 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 here's the here's the thing right those like you said those reviews are 
is essential uh, if we want any sort of momentum, any sort of traction. I don't even want to say momentum because it's getting harder and harder to to get that traction on Amazon with all their algorithm stuff that they do. But so right, right. The the thing is, is one though. I even backtrack before that. You didn't stop. I I know people who have published, and they go through an experience like that where it is hard to get those, and that's the death knell for them. They are done because, like we've been talking about all episode, nobody loves me. Nobody took the time to leave a review. I'm crap. And then they go down that road of negative self-talk to the point where they decided to hang up the keyboard forever. Right. And you didn't allow that to happen to you. You right. took charge. You acted to change that situation. Well, yeah. Here, let, let me let me tell you another because that, that was a pretty short one. So let me tell you one one more quick thing. That that was my first ever Amazon review. My first ever negative review uh, was also for the same book, um, and it was it was two out of five stars. And I only had maybe you know three or four reviews at at this point. So you know, of course, I I see the the average rating just drop. Um, oh yeah, and, yeah. And, and it's it's a crush. I said, oh no, I'm I'm no longer 4.79. Now I'm down to, you know, 4.0 or something. And I went out there and I read the review and I have probably read this review seven or eight times now. I, I don't read my positive reviews. You know, we go and read our negative reviews. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are. But my favorite part of this negative review was this person said, uh, this book is so boring. It's like HP Lovecraft meets Mary Shelley. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so since then, I've kind of developed this attitude of, you know, how often does somebody give a book a bad review, not because the book was wrong, but because they were the wrong reader for that book? Right, exactly. And honestly, sometimes I feel like, you know, that's that's kind of the injustice of it. But, you know, as long as you look at it as eh, it's just it's part of it. You know, and and you look at the negative reviews that you get. If it's if it's a critical of of the book, you know, then ask yourself: Is it because the book is bad, or is it because that just wasn't the right reader for this book? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, and these are behaviorally. You know, we ta- we hit on mindset a couple of times, but it, through your examples like these, it also shows. How you, you know, without, you're doing a little showing, not telling there. How's that for a writing <laughs> podcast? But you're showing, that? you're showing us how you behaviorally process, how you deal with these things. And folks, I'm tired of watching writers quit on this stuff because we know, especially in the digital age, it's real easy to, to be, feel stepped on. It, it absolutely is. But if there's anything that you've taken from this conversation with Lindsay to this point, it's, you know, he could have chosen to focus on all these other things. And maybe sometimes he did wallow in your misery for a day or two or three, and then put your big boy, big girl underwear on and get back to it. That's fine. That's normal. It's where we allow ourselves to slip down that slope of focusing. And and there's, real cognitive science out there that I'm not going to get into because I'm not smart enough, uh, how we can do that. And your, your brain has elasticity. If you start trending towards that negative stuff, you will, you could potentially set yourself up for that. So go back and listen to this entire episode again, if you need to, if you're one of those people, the reason I'm preaching at you, because I used to be one of those people. I saw the negative in everything. The world sucked, and I could show you a thousand examples a day of why the world sucked. And I had an epiphany when I was reading a book on neuroscience one day, and I realized I was my own worst enemy. And once I started focusing on those more positive aspects, the world started changing around me. So when Lindsay pitched this topic of hope to me, I was thinking back to that Paul a half decade ago who was convinced the world sucked. And he just wanted his time here to end because it just wasn't worth it anymore. And then, boom, I saw the light. And I knew, Lindsay, I knew you would do a great job. I didn't want to give you that sales pitch up front because I didn't want to put that kind of uh, (laughs) pressure on you. But it's so, so important. So, folks, if you are that person, if you're that earlier, earlier version of me, there's nothing wrong with you. I was there, too. There's a lot of reasons why we're at that place. Listen to this again. Listen, focus on what he did in response to the things that happen. It's not about what happens to you in life. It's about how you deal 
with the things that happen to you. Now, Lindsay, you've done a lot to endear yourself to the horrible writing audience. At this point, <laughs> what I want to do is give you a chance to kind of brag about some of the things that you've done. You've talked about a couple of your books throughout this, but this is where I need you to kind of lower the humility and really just tell us what is out there that we can go enjoy from you and maybe give us a hint about what's to come. Oh, yeah. So um, let's see, bragging a little bit about myself. Well, you already said in my bio that uh, I've got the Kelton Moore series of uh, steampunk flavored fantasy uh, about a professional monster hunter. Um, book two actually won first place uh, for the Ozma, which is an international award for fantasy. It won that uh, just this last April. That's so awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, book three in, in that series uh, just came out um, last uh, last June. Um, if you are if you're interested in finding out the uh, plot of book four, um, we've actually got a fan promotion going on right now over at uh, you can you can find a link to the uh, fans of Lindsay Schaffer uh Facebook group um, on my author page there. And uh, we're going to, we're doing a special thing where if we can get a certain number of new reviews on the Kelton Moore series, um, I'm going to do a special sneak, uh, sneaky reveal um, at a special online party. Um, so we've already hit the goal to reveal the plot of book four. Um, and this party is going to be later this month, uh, or later in August, excuse me. Um, and, uh, the next goal I think is the next type of ammunition that, uh, Kelton uses because he's, he's got all kinds of great steampunk tech that he uses. So he's got exploding bullets and he's got acid bullets and he's got, um, you know, all the magnetic bullets and stuff. So I'll, I'll reveal what the next type of bullet is that will be appearing in book four. Um, so that's that's something fun that's uh, coming up fairly soon. Um, and also uh, my YouTube channel, if you take a look at that, it's pretty sparsely populated right now. But I'm currently working on a video featuring all of the, the winners and the um, the uh, special mentions of a fan art contest that we just finished up uh, to uh, commemorate the, the release of the new Kelton Moore novel. So a lot of stuff happening across multiple platforms. Um, of course, my books are available on, on Amazon. Um, and uh, one last little thing that I'll throw out there, I am working on the audiobook version of The Beast Hunter. I'm up to chapter five. So uh, we're, we're slowly getting that chipped away for all you audiobook readers out there. So that is so that's- neat. And folks, I will make sure that I put links to Lindsay's stuff in the show notes. So if you are a user of advanced technology, i.e. smartphones, you can go check out his stuff <laughs> right there in your hands. Lindsay, um, I want to thank you for this. This was very, very important. And I'm so glad to essentially break the 30 episode spell of listening to me talk constantly and bring you on and about such an important topic too. This is something I'm on a big sustainability kick lately because I'm seeing a lot of folks tapping out. It may be my bias of what I'm looking for subconsciously, but I'm seeing a lot of writers tapping out. So this episode could not have happened soon enough. I'm absolutely honored to have you and my first Olympia area guest. So that's like doubly, triply cool. Where can people <laughs> find you out on the social webs if you are okay with sharing that kind of information? Um, you know, honestly, probably the best place to uh, get a hold of me is uh, on Facebook, uh, my author page. Um, also, if you go to my my author website, which is just lindsayshoffer.com, um, you sign up for uh, my mailing list. Um, if you just reply uh, to uh, any of the mailing lists that, that go out, it, it's an email that goes directly to me. Um, so that's another way you can get in touch with me. And, and if you do happen to be local to uh, Olympia, um, or, uh, you know, the South Puget Sound uh, region, um, I teach uh, community classes. They're not for college students. They're just for people out of the community. I teach uh, creative writing classes uh, through South Puget Sound Community College. I teach two to three different classes uh, a month. So that's, you know, two or three times every week uh, that you could get together with me. And um, we'll talk about everything from the craft to the business of writing or even just, you know, sit down and do some writing together. So I, I really try to make myself available as a resource to uh, to uh, other other writers out there. That is really cool. Lindsay, I want to thank you one more time for this. And horrible writing fans, until episode 105, keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. 
I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. <laughs> <laughs>